in this era of crony capitalism and reckless risk, there is a new book out about one of the greatest bankers in all of history. And it underscores just what a terrific role model he was in terms of responsibility, not only to his creditors and bankers and debtors, but also to society at large. And this, uh, we're talking about Edmund Safra. The book is titled A Banker's Journey, How Edmund Safra Built a Global Financial Empire. And this was written by bestselling author and journalist Daniel Gross. And is one of the leading journalists of our time in terms of business and finance, economics, politics, and so much more. He has authored eight books. Dan, welcome to the conversation. Great to have you. David, it's a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Dan, uh, you've written so many books. Why this one? Why Edmund Safra? Why tell his story? Uh, briefly, this is a, a figure that not many people know about. He was a man who was born in 1932 in Beirut, went to work in Milan at the age of 15, trading. Uh, working for his family business, and over the course of his life, founded four banks on three different continents. He died tragically in 1999 in a fire. His banks were publicly held. There was one called Republic of New York that was a startup in 1965 and grew to the 11th largest bank uh, in the U.S. when it was sold in 1999. <clears throat> but compared with his contemporary bankers, uh, he had a very kind of upside down view of what the purpose of banking was and what the purpose of a banker was. He came from a world where there was no such thing as deposit insurance in Beirut and Lebanon in the 50s and 60s where people were so insecure. The main thing they wanted to know was that their money was safe. So he took very little risk. Um, he was reluctant to lend money out on like, credit cards or subprime mortgages or things like that. He always made kind of sure loans, helped facilitate trade and finance. And he always said that nobody will lose a penny from my banks until I have lost everything. That's such a different sort of um, path than most people would perceive of most, you know, capitalists and bankers today. So, how did he pull it off? Because obviously he had more challenges than a lot of his contemporaries because he was trying to do things a certain way. Yeah. So he was very much a capitalist. He was very much interested in making money. He was a billionaire in his lifetime when his bank sold in 1999. It was for three billion dollars. But he had a, a kind of a genius for working in different types of cultures. It said he grew up in Beirut. His family was a part of a multi-generational banking family that originated in Syria. So they had a small bank in Beirut that catered to the local community. He moved the family to Brazil in the early 1950s and created a local bank there. He created like a private bank for wealthy people in Switzerland. And when he came to New York in the mid-60s, he created a, a consumer bank for middle-class people. Uh, the whole thing there was you brought in and you opened an account and you would get a television. Um, so that type of bank. So he did different types of banking everywhere he went. And his main focus, um, he was from the Jewish community in Beirut, traced their origins to Syria. This was a time of great displacement, people having to flee, fleeing civil war, being kicked out of their homes. And for this kind of global community of not just his depositors, but the people in his world, he was seen as somebody you went to if you needed help, if you needed money, if you needed your assets and money like taken care of so that when you went to start a new life, you would have something to do it with. I was struck by how you describe him as something of a mysterious sort of man, that he was a pretty private, um, that despite the fact that he had these you know, fine suits that he liked to wear and he liked to stay at really nice hotels, that he wasn't, he didn't cut a huge sort of public figure. So his banks were publicly held, which meant they were traded. You could buy shares in them and they reported their earnings every quarter, just like any other American bank, like J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, but he was, you know, he was not someone who would ever go on CNBC. He didn't do a lot of interviews. Uh, his view was that a banker had to be discreet, and he also kind of believed in, um, you know, the evil eye. That one of the ways you ward off bad things happening is by avoiding sort of too much publicity, too much limelight. He also did a lot of good things. I mean, never mind sort of the banking, but there are countless hospitals and institutions that essentially carry his name. Um, is that did that surprise you? And as you sort of learn more about him, not at all. I think the the, the story uh, of this man is his ethic uh, as a banker was intricately connected to his ethic as a Sephardic Jew, a Jew who came from Syria and from Lebanon, which is that in that community, the people who had means were expected. I only expected, sort of demanded to serve on committees to help people. Um, and in the files I went through, um, in addition to finding like institutional 
donations, like giving money to rebuild synagogues or build hospitals or create professorships. Um, there were literally thousands of examples of sending, you know, someone who was getting married, sending the money, someone who needed a, a new start in life, sending the money, just literally thousands of these. So he did it on a very personal basis. Again, this is going back to the 1950s and 1960s. And he again thought as part of his, I wouldn't say superstition, but belief system that if you did well, you made some money, that was an occasion to donate some money. And it ultimately evolved into a more institutional uh, purpose, which was he set up a foundation. And when he died, he left most of his assets to that foundation, which in the 23 years since his death has focused on medical research, particularly Parkinson's, uh, building up hospitals, treatment centers, uh, education, and religious uh, affairs. You mentioned his death, uh, 1999, and you point out that there was something uh, remarkably tragic about it because he had Parkinson's and he was relatively young. Um, tell me a little bit more about that sort of aspect and, and what his sort of final years were like. Sure, well, he was always someone who was mature beyond his years and looked older than he was. Like I said, he went. his father sent him to go work in uh, Italy when he was 15, and you look at photos from that era, it looked like he was already 30. By the time he was in his 50s, he looked like sort of an older man. He was stricken with Parkinson's um, in his early 60s. Uh, and I say the story is a story of triumph because a story about someone who makes a lot of money, it's always they created this institution, they made all these profits, they amassed all this capital, they did all these great things, they were celebrated. But his story is a, uh, it's a bit of a tragedy on a few fronts. One is that he became too ill to really manage this whole uh, system that he had built up. The second was that you know he regarded all his businesses as family businesses, and he didn't have his own children, and didn't really feel like kind of comfortable elevating someone else to take on uh, this empire that he had built. And the third was that he he died in a fire that had been um, sort of set uh, set by a member of his household staff, and he ended up dying of suffocation. This was 1999, so he died at the age of 66 prematurely. Um, and in a tragic manner. You mentioned that uh, you didn't have any sort of children and that unlike a lot of you know financiers and people in today's age that it's a celebration when you sell your business and you make you know billions. You point out that in his book that he was sad about his yeah, sort of businesses when he- Exactly, was. again, this was someone who, <clears throat> but his great grandparents had been bankers. They were like a family back in Syria, and they sent like one brother to Istanbul, one brother to Alexandria, one brother to Beirut. This was in their kind of heritage and in their gene. And it was something you were born to do and something you were supposed to pass on to your children and to your children's children. And so for him, the, the concept of this bank not existing after his life was you know, a, a very painful thing to contemplate. Um, when he sold his banks, he sold his two banks in 1999 for $10 billion, which was the highest price paid in cash for a bank uh, to that point in American history. A um, friend came from him to Geneva and said, look, you know, fantastic, look, look what you've accomplished. And he said in French, you know, it's terrible, I've sold my children, I've sold my babies. And this was a, you know, for him it was a personal, I, won't, I don't wanna say it was a failing, but it was not something that he personally celebrated at the time. And all of us who celebrate your books know that you uh, are impeccable in terms of your sort of research and, and how much energy you put into sort of the research aspect before you do your writing. Uh, when you're talking about a character, a real life character who has uh, traces his roots to Beirut and to Syria and to so many other sort of places that are normally kind of hard to get to, was this difficult putting putting this together and finding people who knew him who could tell his story? Yeah, on one level part of the tragedy is that the places he came from literally don't exist anymore. I mean, Aleppo is not, not only is the Jewish community there long gone, just Aleppo itself as a city uh, is long gone. And Beirut is really not what it was in the 40s and 50s when it was this cosmopolitan center that was very tolerant. There was a great deal of coexistence. Um, I was afforded the opportunity to access uh, in digitized fashion his personal archives, which had letters going back in six or seven different languages uh, to the 1930s and 1940s. And in addition, in the years after his death, um, people had conducted interviews with people who knew him from when he was in second grade in Beirut to when he was building his banks to when he was older in the 1980s in New York. So I had all these transcripts of these interviews that had been done. And I tried, it was like a, a big jigsaw puzzle that you dump out onto the table with a thousand pieces. And if you can understand how they connect together, you're able to put together a portrait. 
And what do you think Edmund Soffer would say about banking and finance today if he were alive? And, and are there lessons that you think there are other you know, uh, corporate titans can take uh, from his life and his career? Yeah, you know, in 2008, remember when the financial crisis happened and the banks all got bailed out and a lot of people ended up getting bonuses. Somebody wrote a piece and the headline was, you know, where have you gone, Edmund Safra? The idea being that if he was in charge or he was running his banks and he had been alive, we wouldn't have had this situation where the taxpayers had to bail out the companies, but somehow everybody was made whole. He always owned like 30% of his banks, so he was the biggest shareholder. And he always feared that if something happened, because he was from Lebanon, because he was always, wherever he went, he was an outsider, there was no way the government was going to rescue him. So he always felt that everything was on him. He shouldered that responsibility willingly and incorporated that into the type of management. So he didn't make those types of loans that would come back and could really sink your whole ship. Um, so that sense of, of kind of personal responsibility, that what you owe your depositor is their money back and not to take untoward risks with what they've entrusted to you, because it's not just cash, it's not just the balance, it's really, it's your dignity when you have a bank account. The book is A Banker's Journey, How Edmund Safra Built a Global Financial Empire. It is authored by the one and only Daniel Gross, esteemed business journalist, best-selling author of eight books. Dan, thanks so much for joining us, appreciate you being on the conversation. David, it's a great pleasure to see you, great pleasure to be with you always.